Imagine watching the sunset at the end of a perfect day of sailing, sundowner in hand and lounging in the cockpit with ten or so friends. When drinks need topping up, you walk, not step down a ladder, inside for the next round, and despite being just a bit tipsy by now, you don't need to grab onto something for stability. You set your glass down and your glass stays on the counter despite a slightly swelly sea, and with a balmy breeze and clear skies, you're already thinking about sleeping on the trampoline or out on deck. Is this a dream or is this living on a catamaran? This week on Everything You Need to Know, we're talking about the five elements that make a good live aboard sailing catamaran. Hey guys, before we talk about these cats, some of you don't know I have a second YouTube channel. It's called History. It's all about maritime history and I just released a new episode. It's about the mighty sailing ships that we used to lay the first transatlantic cable from North America to Europe. It's super cool. Um, I'll put a link and, and I'll put a link. Hope you guys can check it out and hit subscribe while you're there. Hi, I'm Tim, a lifelong sailor who appreciates the nuances of all kinds of rigs and today we're going to unpack the concept of livability for full-time cruisers, specifically those who prefer two hulls instead of one. You'll find out why galley position is a big deal, how to get a good night's sleep, and whether the cockpits on catamarans genuinely live up to the hype. But before we get started, this is the week of the Annapolis Sailboat Show, and I'm very excited about it. It's my favorite time of year because I get to meet a lot of you guys. Your support for this channel has been truly what keeps me making these videos, so please take a second to give this one a thumbs up and leave a comment at the end. When we talk about livability, we mean the ability to do the vanilla stuff of life while sailing, the stuff we take for granted on land like laundry. Nothing ruins living on a boat quicker than all the things about living on a boat. When we're not trimming sails or checking tomorrow's weather or debating anchorages, people who live on board their vessels must also perform a lot more pedestrian sort of tasks. The not always sexy and yet essential tasks of life, like cooking and eating and sleeping and working for those of us still paying off our lifestyle choices. On any boat, these tasks have the potential to feel like part of a reality TV survival competition or the most underprepared camping trip you've ever taken. There's plates crashing on the floor, mysterious knocking sounds in the night, crowding elbow to elbow just to sit down and eat, or a few examples of unlivability, if that's a word. When considering living on a sailboat as like a whole lifestyle, most of us imagine less raw survival and more extended vacation. And just like on land, life is about those moments in between the tasks, relaxing at the end of a rough day, meeting up with friends, and even exercising to work off some of those beers. These are the moments that make the mundane work of life all worth it. But how do we define livability, or more specifically, good livability, on a catamaran? What if cooking, eating, sleeping, and so on could feel as easy as they do on land? Let's dive in. Anyone who's ever made a sandwich, much less a three-course meal, in gusting wind and lots of swell on a boat knows how important a functional galley can be. Is the storage inside accessible? Is there enough counter space for a cutting board and plates at the same time. Can you talk to everyone else aboard while you're cooking or listen to the VHF from the sink? On a catamaran, galleys below are located a few steps down the saloon in one of the hulls or on the same level as the cockpit called galley up. The budget conscious Gemini MC 105 has a galley below design, yet with her shallow hulls, it puts the chef's head where they can still see and talk to the folks in the saloon. With countertops on the inboard and outboard sides of the hull, the galley in this smaller catamaran feels surprisingly generous with a lot of surface area too. The Gemini has a reasonable amount of storage space for a boat this size as well, with shallow cupboards on either side of the dining banquette. 
and deeper top loading compartments on the outboard side. The downside, of course, to a galley down configuration down in the hull is the separation from the cockpit. You may find yourself running up and down the stairs while cooking underway and feeling a bit removed from the action. Also, if you're alone on the boat and you have to jump out just to scan the horizon and make sure the autopilot isn't drunk, it's a long way to go. And communication between the galley and the cockpit is less of an issue if you're at anchor, but it's something to keep in mind. Next is this Fountain Peugeot. On most models, Fountain Peugeot puts the galley up where you're merely feet away from the cockpit and you can see all the action. You can scan the horizon. You can see out the windows looking forward. However, the counter space is relatively limited and the tiny circular sink bowls are awkward for dishwashing and they cut into the available counter space a lot. Some Fountain Peugeot models include overhead storage though and that can actually make a pretty big difference. Overall, galleys that are designed to share the main level area on the bridge deck with the dining saloon tend to be short on space and work best with one chef at a time. Galleys down, on the other hand, eliminate one of the main benefits of catamaran living, and that's living above the waterline. Like any sailboat, the galley configuration will be as individual and unique as we are. And the question becomes, how important is it to you for the galley to be on the same level as the cockpit? That's what matters. If it's critical and that's a big decision for you, the aspect of livability will narrow down your list of perfect catamarans. Next up, we're going to talk about sleeping. A good night's sleep is critical to a happy sailor, whether you're on land or on a boat. And ask any sailor or sailor spouse or children, catamarans tend to rock less than monohulls, but they aren't free from movement entirely. It's just a different kind of movement. And with catamarans, you generally get a nice arrangement of three or four cabins, typically two in the back and two in the front. Any extra berths quickly become more storage, and some sailors get really creative in catamarans, renovating one of the bedrooms into an extra space, like the always needed workshop or sewing room or an extra pantry area if you're bringing lots of food. But back to sleep. A key ingredient to a good night's sleep is quiet. The slapping of waves between the two hulls and the bridge deck is a notorious problem on catamarans, and it's a problem you don't want to take lightly. Tossing and turning all night, wondering if those are just waves slapping your hulls or something more ominous, probably isn't part of the relaxing lifestyle that you imagined when you moved onto a boat. Bridge deck slapping is one area you might miss noticing while you're boat shopping online or touring a boat with a broker. So add this to your essentials to check on list when considering different cats. Bridge deck slapping tends to be worse on catamarans with lower bridge decks. In other words, the space between the waterline and the bottom of your saloon floor. One rule of thumb is checking that the bridge deck clearance is between 5 and 7% of the overall length of the boat. So if you're looking at a 40 foot catamaran, you'll want to see at least 24 to 34 inches between the water and the bottom of the bridge deck. And remember that measurement reflects a fully loaded boat with all your gear and provisions, filled tanks, all that stuff. Bridge deck slapping is a small but significant difference between monohulls and catamarans and it's worth considering as part of livability. The mission here at Lady K Sailing has always been to get more people sailing more easily. If you'd like to help out, please consider becoming a patron. Patrons are people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make this all possible. A big shout out to all the existing patrons who have gotten us this far. I really couldn't do these videos without you guys. One thing I want to emphasize here about cats before we go on, or maybe the difference between cats and monohulls. This is just a personal note. Cats like to be light. Monohulls like to be heavy, so when you move on to a boat with all your stuff, your food storage, tools, spare parts, paddle boards, extra beer, I don't know, a monohull is designed to be very heavy and they tend to be okay with the added weight. It's a full displacement hull anyway. A cat, however, largely sits above the waterline and it's very affected by weight. Setting a cat down an extra few inches into the water can have a dramatic impact on its sailing ability, its ability to point, its speed, its maneuverability, everything. Also, you have to balance the weight you do add between the two hulls. You don't want to make one hull very heavy and that much slower 
than the other hull. It would really ruin the sailing performance of the cat and add a lot of extra stress to the structure of the boat when you're clipping along in 20 knots of breeze with one hull trying to go much slower than the other. Okay, let's talk about cockpits. The cockpit is the heart of the boat. It's where most of the sailing action occurs, assuming all your lines are led aft to the cockpit. The helm station and the surrounding area is what comes to mind for most of us when we think about sailing as a lifestyle. If a monsoon isn't imminent, the cockpit is likely where you'll eat and relax at the end of the day. And when you're visiting the islands and making friends, the cockpit becomes the gathering spot. You'll find that you spend most of your time here, outside, in the cockpit, so comfort out here is pretty critical. And catamarans typically have a very, very spacious cockpit compared to monohulls. And the beamy stern creates an ample rectangle that allows for all sorts of permanent things like tables and ice boxes and pretty generous seating. And finally, you can invite more than two people aboard and maybe even consider adopting a dog or two. As your budget allows, and depending on where you'll plan to be sailing, you'll want to consider bimini's. You want to cover that space and probably screens to keep the bugs out if you go anywhere near Florida. Eyes and glass enclosures and shade to increase your comfort against all the elements. Some catamarans like the Gemini 105 can be configured with a dinghy davit hammock that's extra seating at the stern. Otherwise, you can get creative and string up a hammock just about anywhere on a catamaran. For those of you that plan to do a lot of fishing, the underside of those biminis in that massive cockpit provides a con convenient place to store rods, and the sugar scoops are really handy for reeling in the catch and cleaning the fish. On a model hull, when you clean the fish, you do it on the cockpit floor, and it gets really messy. When it's time for a sundowner, and let's hope that that's pretty much every day, some cushions, some cheap Christmas lights from Amazon, and a Bluetooth speaker can transform your cockpit into a floating oasis. And isn't that why we're doing this anyway? Cockpit livability is easy to come by in most catamarans and a few creature comforts go a long way in making it the heart of your home and truly a nice place to be. But not all cats are created equal. Some of the smaller cats don't leave much room in the cockpit at all, while bigger cats have more than enough to have Taco Tuesday on your boat once a week. I know this firsthand. One good thing that emerged from the COVID-19 era is the recognition that many jobs can be done remotely. And if you are one of those folks that can earn an income from a keyboard and a reasonable internet connection, you might wonder why you're still paying rent for a place with a lousy view that never changes. With the advent of technology like Starlink, working from a sailboat is no longer some futuristic fantasy. You can blog or Zoom or YouTube your way to a modest income with a million dollar view that changes at your whim. Caveat here though, no internet service is 100% reliable all the time. You can bet that as soon as you have a Zoom call, the Starlink's gonna go out. This stuff changes faster though than Twitter became X. So do your research and set realistic expectations based on data. For example, actually talk to people that are working on that service in the place that you're probably going to be sailing. Get some real-time information. Now, getting all that tech set up on your boat is an effort. Undoubtedly, the initial outlay of installing a reliable system is going to be a little bit expensive, but it's an investment in a lifestyle that might feel more like work than play in the beginning. But if you're prepared for that, there are worse things than remotely working from your boat as you cruise the Bahamas. With their reputation for greater stability, catamarans make working at a table or a desk a lot easier. Your laptop, your camera gear, speakers, whatever else your work requires will stay put in most conditions. And weather allowing, you'll have some choice on where to perform that work and which background to show in your Zoom meeting. Maybe it's the cockpit, maybe it's the saloon, or if you're feeling really bold, maybe it's the trampoline up front on the bow. Of course, all of this hardware is a huge suck on your energy consumption, so you'll need to make sure that your catamaran has the power to support you while you work on board. You may want to add some solar arrays, and that's a place where all cats tend to shine. The wide beam means you can put on a massive arch to support thousands of watts of solar. Look, living on a sailboat full time means you're getting some degree of exercise just by trying to stand upright in the morning. And with fewer challenges to your balance living on a catamaran, 
you might need to carve out more time to stay in shape. The good news is catamarans have more spaces that allow you to stretch out from the bow all the way back to the cockpit and the top of the hard bimini if you have one. Throw a mat down on your trampoline or fiberglass bow for your crunches, planks, and downward dogs. Get your first mate or maybe a buddy or two while you're at it. There's plenty of room on the bow of most catamarans. You can rig up some stretchy straps to the mast for bicep and tricep strength. And with the side decks being so big, you'll quite often have a lot of room for kayaks and paddle boards and all sorts of stuff like that. And of course, when at anchor, you're going to get lots of time swimming by jumping in those gin clear waters and circling your house for a few hours or so. Scrub the water line while you're in there. It's a really good workout. The sugar scoops are ready for you to clamber back aboard when your heart rate is back at its resting zone. Choosing to live aboard any sailboat prioritizes the adventure of sailing life over the conveniences of a brick and mortar house. It's a trade-off and you'll compromise a never-ending backlog of laundry for true sea breeze fresh scent. Most daily tasks on even a slightly rocky boat take a lot more effort, carry more safety risk, and take longer to perform than the same jobs back on land. And these little tasks we do each day over and over and over again truly add up, so it's worthwhile to find ways to increase your convenience as you move onto the boat, better livability. One more personal thought on cats, and this is from my experience helping people buy boats. So if you're looking to buy a cat, lagoons and leopards and boats like that, their ability to sail is a known quantity. We can Google how well they do in 20 knots of wind, how well they point, all that stuff. But I've helped a few boat buyers recently that were looking at lesser known cats. Cats with no discernible reputation, very nice boats. Cats that we have no way of knowing though, how they really behave in the wild. If you're interested in one of those lower production run cats, the ones built in Africa and things like that, before you spend half a mil buying one, insist that the sea trial is done at the first reef point. Cats have a very definitive reef point based on wind speed because they can't heal over like a mono hull to bleed off the extra powerful wind. So we reef the mainsail early on cats. Whatever cat you're interested in, ask for a sea trial in the wind that meets the manufacturer's suggested first reef point. This will show you how your new half million dollar cat is really going to behave in the weather that you'll actually be experiencing on the day to day in real life once you own the boat. And if you need help buying a boat and want to book an hour of my time, head over to ladyksailing.com forward slash consults. I'd love to hear from you. Does your dream boat have a galley up or a galley down a few steps? Will you crack a beer from the hammock in the cockpit or will you be lounging on the trampoline? What kind of exercise could you really commit to while underway? Start thinking about your live aboard life and what feels most important to you. Also, comment below if you're already a catamaran sailor. Did I nail it here or did I miss something? What other reasons pulled you into the catamaran life? Let me and everyone else know in the comments below. Until next week, friends, I hope to see you in Annapolis. But otherwise, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. We'll see you.